My name is Stephen Milano, and I am the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research. And so before we get started, I want to, uh, the dean has asked me to brag a little bit about uh, our college. So the Wall Street Journal recently ranked UHD among the top 400 colleges in the United States. And specifically, we were recognized as being number one for diversity and number three for student experience. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of wonderful things happening here at UHD, especially right here in the College of Public Service. Our Masters of Science and Criminal Justice program has been recognized yet again as one of the best online programs in the country by US News and World Report. It's the sixth year in a row that that's happened. So, so just a few things that's going on. And you know, obviously we believe here with criminal justice, social work, and urban education as our core in this college, that public service is of vital importance to everybody. So kudos to you guys who are in those fields and for being here. So now, as you may know, Vital Voices serves as a forum to bring practitioners, experts, and speakers here to the college to speak on issues that are related to the public good, such as emotional dysregulation that we're going to hear tonight about. Our guests speak from their professional experiences and expertise about how their work impacts society as a whole. And it's our intention to showcase individuals whose expertise um, what's the word, um, it's interdisciplinary and touches upon the fields of criminal justice, social work, and urban education. So over the years, we, we have explored a, a, a plethora of subjects uh, relevant to the community, youth and the criminal justice system, homelessness, reducing recidivism, the graying of America, no pun intended, um, <clears throat> immigration, social violence, children's grief and trauma, bail reform, cognitive dissonance, voting justice, modern day slavery, just to name a few. So I am going to ask Dr. Angela Goins, who is a professor in our social work department, to come and introduce tonight's speaker. And, and where is she? There she is. Okay, Angela, come on. So good, e oh. okay. good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Dr. Goins, I'm in the social work program, and it's my uh, honor tonight to introduce to you our special speaker, Dr. Christopher Fowler. He completed a four-year postdoctoral fellowship in clinical psychology uh, between 1995-99. He was a prodigy, started when he was five. <laughs> at the Austin, I'm just playing, but he does look extremely young. At the Austin Rick Center, where he advanced to clinical leadership positions, serving as a director of clinical research and a clinical team leader for 10 years. In 2011, he and his family moved to Houston, where he served as an associate director of research and director of psychology at the Menninger Clinic. In 2018, he joined Houston Methodist Behavioral Health as a senior clinician. He currently holds academic appointments as professor of psychology at Houston Methodist Academic Institute, Well Cornell uh, Medical College, I hope I said that right, Manager Department of Psychi uh, Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Baylor College of Medicine. His clinical research work focuses on the assessment and treatments of adults suffering from serious mental illness and personality disorders. As a researcher, Dr. Fowler has over 140 publications. That's impressive. That is huge. In the areas of personality disorders, uh, suicide, neuroimaging, and treatment outcome. He's an internationally recognized personality researcher and currently serves on several professional journal editorial boards, including the Journal of Psychiatric Practice and Psychotherapy, training research and practice. Dr. Fowler is currently the executive clinical director at the Monarch Community, a long-term residential treatment center affiliated with Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, on a personal note, I actually work for Dr. Fowler at the Monarch Community, uh, although I'm a full-time assistant professor. For those of you social work students, uh, I received my supervision hours there at the Monarch community, uh, community. So I've worked there for four years doing therapy with the residents there. It is a wonderful uh, community. And Dr. Fowler came on board as our clinical director and I have heard nothing but wonderful reviews from him. He's a great part-time boss. Uh, and he has taught me a lot in the field of mental health and continues to do so. So it is with my great honor uh, to uh, introduce him today to you, and please give him a warm UHD welcome round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here, uh, to see all of these young faces. She was very kind. I'm really not young at all, right? Um, so I'm here to talk to you about things that I think really have a lot of crossover with all that you do and all the people that you touch in your professional careers, right? And that is, how do we reach people? How do we open their ears up to learning? How do we help them trust us enough so that we can do our work with them? And this, you know, in an institution like this, where we're all here, vibrant learners, very interested in learning, absorbing things. I remember my college days in the 1920s. It was really fabulous. I love being in college. I love being in university life. So you're all well primed for that. But some of the people that you encounter in your day-to-day -day work are not so keen on learning. They may have reasons, many good reasons why they really can't open themselves up to you or to other people or to institutions. And so tonight, I hope to give you a bit of extra so that you can go out and use some of these techniques to reach those folks because they really, as much as they may need help, they sometimes struggle with it. And oftentimes it is because they are enormously stressed out. And sometimes it's because they have stress and they have trauma that impacts their ability to trust in other people, particularly authority figures. I'm sorry, all these wonderful young faces, you're all gonna be authority figures to all these folks, yeah? All right, so the title's really way, way too long, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, and first, let me just uh, define paralinguistics without saying a word, are you ready? That is paralinguistics. All of the nonverbal communications that go on between us humans, the way that we carry ourselves, our countenance, our facial expressions, our tone of voice, our pacing, our prosody, all of those elements are exceedingly important for people who are frightened, disenfranchised, traumatized, distrusting, etc. And I'll try to let you know why I think that's the case and why oftentimes our words are simply not enough, right? Even our best intended words will not be enough for them. Okay, so before I get into the formal part, let's have a little interactive bit here, okay? Just to get an idea of how you all deal with stress and emotional overload, okay? So by a sign of hands, who amongst us has ever been stressed out? Uh, easy, right? Next question. Who amongst us has been so stressed out that they have said or done something that they later think, oh God, why did I do that? Has anyone ever been really upset, angry, frustrated, etc., and said something to a loved one which you really, really regret later? Okay. This is part of the issue of the difficulty with stress re regulation, emotion regulation, and getting overwhelmed. We as human beings are really not geared to be at our best when we're emotionally overwhelmed. And the reason is because we, our brains have to share resources across different domains. When we are really anxious, our HPA axis, certain circuit in our brain that's called the stress circuit, is very active and very busy. Our frontal lobes, the executive functioning branch of our brain, goes on brownout. And that's why we all say terrible things to our loved ones when we're upset, okay? So not that it's an excuse, but rather it's an explanation. So don't say terrible things to your loved ones, you'll regret it later, but you're gonna do it anyway, yeah? All right. Now, when we think about, and I, I invite you all to think about the clients that you serve, the individuals that you see in your various populations and sites, think the next time you sit with somebody, huh, I wonder if this person can hear me. I wonder if they can take in what I'm saying. Even that recognition on your part helps you to then do something we call mentalizing, which is just reflecting on the other person's experience. And it might help you slow down a little bit. It might help you to change the cadence and the pace of your speech. And for me, what I try to do is to be simpler in my speech. When someone's really anxious and overwhelmed, I try to make my comments like haikus, like really, really short, 
brief things, simple, yeah? Because they can't take in too much information. All right, now, let's talk about some of the negative impacts of being stressed out, frightened, and traumatized. And tonight I'll be kind of toggling back and forth between stress and trauma because people who are traumatized are much more uh, vulnerable to stress. And really minor stresses for some people will be major overwhelming stresses for those folks, yeah? So here are some links and things that happen with people who have a lot of stress, overwhelmed, and they have reason to distrust everyone. One, and we'll hear this from an expert a little bit later, they have difficulty learning from others, particularly social learning, the kind of learning that you all try to provide in your day-to-day -day encounters. Has anyone ever gone to a doctor and sat with the doctor and the doctor gives you some information, he's wearing a white coat, and you say, got it, got it, got it, and then you walk out to the elevator and you're like, I don't got it. <laughs> Anybody? We call that white coat hypertension. And it, again, is another example of how when we're stressed out, when we're anxious, when we're fearful, we may have every intention of catching all the information and it goes out the window because our brains can't process the information. So if you've had that, then you can completely understand how your clients, how the people you're serving are going to have that at times. Yeah? All right. Now, stress, trauma, attachment trauma, and distrust also are related to medical and psychiatric illnesses. It just turns out that whatever our genetic vulnerabilities are, when we live with chronic stress, when we have a great deal of trauma, those kind of symptoms emerge. It's called epigenetic uh, factors that come and make that presentation much more serious. Our willingness and capacity to benefit from relationships with other people this includes things like showing up to our appointments, <laughs> uh, being on time, being present for the, you know, the clients being there, all of which are very much impacted by it. Even taking medications as prescribed by a doctor can sometimes be very difficult for people who don't trust. Yeah? Then the capacity for self-care, which is a, a robust factor, which unfortunately causes all kinds of downstream problems when people can't take care of their daily living habits, right? And those in the social work field, those in the criminal justice field that do things like probation work know this very, very well. Okay, so what does this translate into kind of an immediate thing that we can do as providers to help with people who have some background in trauma, who may present to us as very stressed? Well, first, we have to realize that it's gonna take more time. It's just gonna take much more time to form a trusting bond, to get buy-in from them, and for them to be able to hear us. And so all of us, and any of you that are uh, on timelines, right, and you have to get something done, one thing you can do is kind of give yourself a bit of a break and say, well, I'll do my best to get this done, but given the circumstances, I may not be able to reach this person today, right? Do any of you get a second chance with folks? I mean, if you go, if you have clients, do you see them repeatedly? Yeah, okay, I see some heads nodding. Great, then I like to say to myself, I fight for another day, right? If I cannot get something accomplished in day one, it may be day three or day seven where I can start to get some more with them, but I have to be okay with not getting it done in that moment. Because guess what happens? Then I get stressed, right? I get overwhelmed. And then what am I good for, right? Then I'm causing trouble for them. All right. The other thing that people that have these kind of struggles need, they need much more of that, what we call paralinguistic communication. They need amplified signals from us that we are safe, that we are okay. If we tell them we're safe and okay, well, they may not believe us. But if we give signals that we're safe and okay, then it's easier for them to catch that. And we'll explain why that is the case a little bit later. It's very implicit, very unconscious, and it works wonderfully. Quick example, when I was in graduate school and I was doing my first psychotherapy cases in the clinic, I was very, very dedicated and I wanted to be the best therapist that I could be. So when someone would be talking to me, I'd be doing this. 
And uh, it turns out that that's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> so I had the good fortune of having my sessions videotaped and we had you know, group supervision and so we show a tape and all my supervisors said, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing that? And I'm like, I, I'm trying to convey that I'm interested and take, no, you're scowling at them. I was like, oh my God, I'm scowling at them. Oh no. So I had to work on my eyebrows being raised, my voice being a bit higher, not too high of pitch, but a little higher to octave. And whenever I had the urge to do this, I would not do it. I'd do something like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're now in the paralinguistic world. Okay, the last piece is that as much as we have in terms of our technologies, and I'm a big fan of treatments that are evidence-based and have manuals and all those things. I've done lots of research on those things. One of the major outcomes for a good outcome for psychotherapy or any kind of clinical encounter are these nonverbal things, right? In medicine, they call it having a good bedside manner, right? Have any of you ever seen the movie Patch Adams, right? Great example of good bedside manner, able to turn someone who's very distrustful into trusting, and then the medicine can actually work. It's the idea, yeah? Okay. Now, uh, a couple of things that, please don't bore yourself with all the references, et cetera, but rather to understand a bit of why trauma has such an impact and downstream impacts on all kinds of functionings. We first have to wrestle with the notion that about 61% of adults have experienced some level of traumatic experience, right? They may not be all the same types. Some are betrayal traumas. Some of them are attachment traumas. Some of them are physical and sexual abuse traumas, et cetera, but 61%. And females and racial minorities have a higher incidence than the general population. So, you know, just imagine encountering almost anyone, you're going to run into someone in your clinical caseload that is experiencing this and may have a lot of reasons to distrust. So traumatic experiences lead to problems with everything from arthritis to diabetes to cancer and to digestive issues. Now, is it the cause? No, there are underlying genetic causes for this. There's dietary issues, et cetera, but stress makes it all much, much worse, yeah? Stress also includes our, our ability to regulate our affects as our earlier example gave. Everyone's hand went up and I said, oh, if you're stressed out, do you ever say anything that you later regret? Yeah, everybody said yes. Behavioral dysregulation, lower distress tolerance, and this is a terrible one, but for people who've been traumatized, they have an increased likelihood of being traumatized again, right? They just, they're not magnets for it, but they're sit, the kind of the signals that they give and the things that they pick up oftentimes leave them much more vulnerable than the average person, which is a, a terrible irony. They also have an increased risk for depression and of course, post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, they have a greater incidence of all types of psychiatric illnesses. And then of course, impaired trust, impaired ability to, to create a secure relationship with another, peop, another person also impacts quality of life. Yeah, and in a terrible way. So some insights from attachment theory and research that uh, I think are very interesting and wonderful to know, particularly as, uh, as kind of guards for us and reminders to us that everyone that we encounter, even if they smile and they seem very engaged, may in fact have more of an insecure attachment style, yeah? So those people with uh, secure attachments, if you're one of them, lucky you, good for you, wonderful, fabulous. Uh, what this usually means is that you're protected from developing a personality disorder, right? It's actually a protective factor, having a secure attachment style. These individuals have a greater ability to regulate emotions and their affects. Their self-esteem is buoyed much better. They're less reactive to this. And overall, in stress life, they don't experience as much stress as people with insecure attachment styles. They still get upset. They still have arguments with their loved ones. They still have ruptures in relationships. They just recover a little faster. They get upset, they cool down faster, yeah? The opposite is true for people with insecure attachment styles and insecure attachment systems. They have a greater likelihood of all types of psychopathology, 
And those are triggered usually by stressful life events. And what I might consider a stressful life event may be very different from someone with an insecure attachment style, yeah? They have difficulty utilizing social supports. So very often, um, even if there is someone in their life that is concerned, caring, loving, a treatment provider, et cetera, they don't always use them, they can't use them, right? Because of the issue with trust and the need to defend, et cetera. They do in fact have a great deal of difficulty down-regulating emotions, much more so that pe than people of the secure attachment style. And they have risk factors for all types of physical illnesses. And then the things that affect us in our professional roles, particularly individuals with insecure attachment styles, tend to have difficulty forming and maintaining a working relationship with their providers, whether it's a dentist or you know, a GI doctor or someone who's prescribing medications for type two diabetes, they have a harder time formulating that and they also have a harder time following the medication regimens, yeah? So these lead to things like relatively poor medication uh, compliance, particularly with diabetes, this guy, Chinowski did a series of studies with type one and type two diabetics. He looked at their attachment style, their attachment uh, security status, and what he found over time is those individuals with fearful and dismissive attachment styles had terrible difficulty following through with medication, terrible difficulty following through and keeping up with uh, physical activity, their all-cause mortality over a five-year period was much worse than people with a secure attachment style, yeah? And so this has profound impacts beyond our particular area of work, yeah? Okay. Any questions? If you do, just throw a hand up. We can, we can get into a question, okay? All right. Now, this is an interesting area. It takes us a little off target just for a moment, but it really highlights how much trust and distrust impact all kinds of areas of life and functioning. So uh, first, placebo and nocebo. Placebo effect is when we give someone in a clinical trial a sugar pill and tell them that it is an antidepressant and they take the sugar pill and we monitor them and they get better, right? <coughs> they're not getting an active ingredient, they're getting a placebo. Individuals, with secure attachment styles, with trusting relationships with their doctors, tend to have a much higher proportion of placebo effect. Right? They get better from a sugar pill. Individuals with insecure attachment styles have what we call a nocebo effect with greater prevalence. And nocebo is no actual effect. They don't improve in terms of what the medication targets and they get almost every side effect imaginable, some of which aren't even on the black box warnings, right? I've had patients who take a medication, they come to see me, they swallowed the medication five minutes ago and they've got three side effects already. The pill is not dissolved and hasn't gotten into their bloodstream yet, but they have them and they are completely convinced that this is the case. And I'm telling you, it's not just in their mind, quote, made up, right? What happens is a part of the brain called the anterior rostrum gets activated in individuals who are very prone to the nocebo effect. The anterior rostrum is also known to be activated during fear response, right? So the same area of the brain gets activated when someone has a nocebo effect as when they're terribly frightened. So it tells us oh, these individuals are really fearful. They're fearful of what the medication will do. This part of the brain gets activated and then they in fact start to have everything from hives to, you know, can you imagine palpations, heart palpations, <coughs> brachycardia, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the other thing that we know is that for people who have a likelihood for placebo effect, it's not just fake. They're not just putting on airs and telling us what we want to hear. They actually do benefit physiologically from that placebo effect. Things like endogenous opioids are activated when they think that they've gotten a medication. Yeah, very interesting stuff. 
So the last thing is this sometimes will affect some of you when you get into the profession is that a medication and placebo, placebo medication and supportive treatment more effective than just the medication alone. So if someone has a preponderance for thinking, oh, this is going to help me, they benefit from the medication and the supportive treatment, right? If someone has a nocebo effect, they benefit very little from either of them. Yeah? Okay, so now you're thinking, God, Fowler, you're depressing me. You're bringing me down. Come on. Where's the... Where are you going to get to the point of what we can do? Yeah? Okay. All right. So in a moment, we'll get there. But first, I want to show you a brief, very brief video and then talk about it a bit more. So this person, his name is Peter Fonagy, and he's one of my mentors. Uh, he's at the University College of London, and he's an expert in too many things, but the things that are relevant here are, he's an expert in attachment theory, in psychotherapy, in neuroimaging, and he's one of the leading experts in trust, and in this, this area that's developing called the study of epistemic trust, yeah? And here he's talking not so much about psychotherapists and their patients, he's talking about school teachers, right? He's talking about how children learn from teachers, yeah? All right, so now let's see if I can figure out how to get this started with this thing. There we go. The ability of a child to learn from a teacher depends on that child trusting their teacher just the same way that a, tr a child trusts their parents or other adults. When we trust someone, we open our minds to them, open our ability to learn. So when I think about teachers who had influenced me, they were teachers who actually took an interest in me as a person. And that somehow creates a key, opens a door on a, a part of my mind where I'm willing to learn new things from that person. We call this, find always the most complicated word to describe the simplest thing. We call this epistemic trust, a trust in knowledge. If I feel understood by you, I'll open my mind to you so that you will be able to teach me and I will learn from you about things that mathematics, English, whatever that subject is. So what actually turns out from uh, actually decades of research and education that children learn best from teachers uh, who have an accurate and individual understanding of them as a person, as a child. And uh, a, a, a guy called John Hattie did 800 meta-analyses to actually show that this was the case. And I, you heard it right, it's 800 meta-analyses. And it turns out uh, that the, what I've discovered for myself is that the teacher who actually gave all of us a book that she specially chose for each of us uh, was the teacher that we learned most from, all of us in the class. And she did that at the end of each term, a book that she chose specially for each of us. And it took me, I kid you not, it took me about 18 months in psychotherapy to figure out why I got the book that I got. Then I figured out why. She gave them out randomly. But at the same time, we all felt recognized by her. We all felt that she treated us as individuals. And we all had our minds wide open to her. So a child who cannot trust, who cannot recognize when they are being recognized because they can't mentalize or because they're so suspicious, they can't recognize when they're being mentalized, will close their minds to learning. And that's why children in an educational environment, when they had a history of maltreatment, actually struggle so much because they simply do not trust the teacher being there in their interest, teaching them the things that they should learn. They feel that it's something that the teacher is doing for themselves rather than them. And we know from the literature out there that actually children who have a maltreatment history struggle educationally. They often 
are excluded from schools because of their behavior. They change schools. They have special edu- much more likely to have special educational needs. A whole host of trouble in addition to the mental health problems that they develop. And yet, there is no cognitive anomaly that under, uh, underpins this. It's simply that the relationship that they are able to develop is not optimal for the capacity for a human being to learn from another human being. And that is, I think, in some ways, the tragedy of trauma. So, Peter Fonagy, right? He's saying to us several things, but if you noticed, he's also doing something with us as he's saying it, yeah? He's saying, uh, we learn best when we trust the other person, when the other person, actually we get the feeling that they care about what's going on inside of us. Take that with you when you go see your folks, right? See if you can do that. But the other thing he's doing the whole time He's one of the most entertaining, captivating, shrinks slash geeky, you know, uh, intellectuals that I know for sure. He, he just, he brings you in, in a way that's very, very warm and inviting. So he's been a long time psychoanalyst and he's very good at what he does. He consults a lot with folks. And what he really tries to help people do is to relax, particularly young therapists, to relax, to be themselves and to be curious about the person that's in front of them, rather than worrying about their supervisor watching the tape, you know, rather than, yeah, anything like that, right? They're there. Okay. So let's talk a bit about this paralinguistic business for a moment and just a bit longer, and then we'll talk, uh, I'll show you a brief film clip that links the neurobiology to this idea and why this actually has traction not only in the fields of psychotherapy and education, but also in the science field of like, here's how our brains work. Here's how we as human beings function. Yeah, to kind of normalize it in a sense. Okay, so here is what we know at this point about the paralinguistic communication and its uh, its application to what we call therapeutic presence. And I really mean this most broadly. This would be true for educators. This is true for people in social work field that are working with families, uh, people in the parole system that are working with parolees, et cetera. Uh, all of these principles have the same kind of impact no matter what kind of setting you're in. One, <clears throat> this channel, the channel of voice, prosody, facial expression, et cetera, tone, This is what people can actually pick up when they're stressed out, when they're frightened. The words may be too much for them because again, their their executive functioning area is kind of in brownout. But the parts of their brain that will function will be things like the HPA axis. Oh, oh, there's someone that's safe. Oh, okay, I can relax a little bit, yeah? And then their ears may perk up and they can start hearing. At that point, maybe their cognition returns a bit and they're able to think a bit more, yeah? Uh, When we're able to do this, we can help them reduce their fear and help them uh, improve their own capacity to do what we call mentalizing, reflect, think broadly, think flexibly, right? Take perspective, all these things that are super important when people are in the weeds and they can't get out of them, yeah? I teach a class to at Methodist as well as at Monarch, which is just all about helping people utilize internal uh, states to regulate so that their mentalizing can come back online. Because until they have that, they cannot do much of anything. Yeah? Okay. And then we just heard from Peter Fonagy that um, when we're engaged in this kind of activity, we can increase the ability to trust And then when trust is in place, when we feel like the other person actually cares about us and what we're learning, then the door is open, as he said, yeah? And that's what we want for all of our clients, all of our patients, et cetera. Now, there are some really big challenges to doing this, okay? And the first one is, one, it's a primarily an implicit automatic system, right? 
our efforts to try to, you know, me to go from this to this takes work. It's not like I can just do it because one time I say, oh, that's a bad thing to do. So we have to be consciously aware of it and make it an explicit part of our work. Now, I bet you in this group of people that there are lots of people with great bedside manners, naturally just very gifted. You probably wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't interested in human beings and what makes them tick, right? And so you probably already have a natural inclination for this. What I'm advocating is that we try to really focus on it, particularly before we go in to meet with a new client or when we're about to encounter a client we've had a really not so great experience with recently, right? Because our tension is gonna be higher, our blood pressure will be higher, and then of course our facial features will be a little flatter, et cetera, yeah? Okay, so it's also very, very difficult to muster when we're stressed out, right? And so I'd like to take 30 seconds before I see a patient. If I've been on a call or doing 80 different things and I'm like, ah, then I'll take 30 seconds just to breathe. That's about all I'm doing, center myself a little bit, and then see them. Because I promise you, when I go in without doing that, they can see it, I mean, it's immediate. They, know exact, they don't know exactly what's wrong, but they know something's wrong. What's wrong with Fowler? Something's not quite right. I might have to be careful with this guy today. Okay, so that's difficulty when we're overwhelmed, so we have to work on that a bit. Uh, anyone here a perfectionist? Anyone likes to do it every time really, really well? Yeah, well, uh, that's also a challenge because you know perfectionism is the evil of the good enough, right? And so uh, if you carry with you a lot of perfectionism in terms of encounters with other people that need your help, um, you've already put yourself in a down position in terms of your ability to be flexible, to be at ease, to put them at ease, etc. right? I suffer with that. That's where this came from, right? I was trying to be a great therapist, so yeah. Okay. Okay, so when I think about this business of the intersection of trauma, stress, etc., what we're going to learn about next, which is called neuroception and paralinguistic communication, I think about these two different channels. And the way I think about them is completely different than what, the way I thought about it when I was a student. So that big yellow amplitude signal uh, is, is what I used to think of as verbal communication, right? That that's where all the action was in my interpretations, my really smart things to say to them, my deep verbal empathy for them, etc. And this other thing, this little blue line down there, well, whatever, that, that other stuff, right? being a good person or being friendly, etc. Well, my attitude about that's completely flipped. I think the verbal, uh, what we say to them is important. The interpretations we provide, the information we provide them is very important as well. But really the big signal, particularly for people who are stressed out, is the paralinguistic, is our facial features, is our, the way that we talk to them, yeah? And so that takes a lot of pressure off of me. I don't have to be nearly as smart, right? I don't, I don't have to know nearly as much as I used to, which is kind of paradoxical because, you know, 25 years ago, I was starting out as a therapist and thought I needed to know everything and was upset if I didn't know something. Now, I'm completely, completely comfortable with not knowing anything. And I'll say it to them, I have no idea. Doctor, why do I do this? I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's figure it out. Oh, okay, well, so we can do that kind of thing. Exactly. So uh, shifting that perspective a bit can be very, very helpful, yeah? Now, not every patient, of course, is gonna be thrilled with that. What you mean you don't know? What, where'd you get your degree? That kind of thing. But if you have time with them, they will start to get it, right? And you're also inviting them to think about answers to their own problems. Okay, so one more brief segment of a video. Um, this fellow, his name is Seth Porgus. Seth is a neuroscientist. And he's doing this talk. These are called nerd talks. It's a bit like TED Talks, except it's in a bar with clinking glasses. And he's carrying on about a topic that's very important to him, which is this business of the way that we communicate with all kinds of different channels of communication. And very, very importantly, how people who have trauma backgrounds, high stress backgrounds, how they perceive 
the other person and what happens inside them. So we'll let this play for about four or five minutes. I got a couple more slides and then we'll have time for, you know, conversation, etc. Okay. And the way we do this is a sense we're going to call neuroception. What neuroception is, this is the way our bodies unconsciously scan the world around us and look for signs of safety and signs of danger and use that information in order to influence all of these things in our bodies that we don't constantly control. Every time you meet somebody, your neuroception is scanning them and saying, are you safe or are you dangerous? And the answer to that question tells you everything. So the important thing is that neuroception is instant. Neuroception is automatic. When you meet somebody, you don't think to yourself, I like this person, I'm gonna open up. It just kind of happens. When you meet an animal, you don't think to yourself, that's a safe animal. It just sort of is known by your body. And so the thing about neuroception is that this external force, this ability to have outside forces hit our nervous system is so powerful that it allows us to actually physically control our own bodies and other people's bodies in ways that are actually very, very surprising. Depending on the, 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 the sounds you hear and the lights you hear and the sense of safety you get about anything you meet in the world, a lot of things change about your body and about your nervous system. And the old model for how the nervous system works, that there's this sympathetic system and parasympathetic and there's two states, that's not really the truth. In fact, there's three states. And this is something that even if, are there any neuroscientists out here tonight? No, there's like three, right? Yeah, come on. I mean, now you're like, no, I was taught in school that there's just these two things, but I'm, you're wrong. Um, so there's three. And I'm gonna view this as like a traffic light. So every time you meet somebody or meet a thing or animal, your body has to kind of determine how safe are you? And it does this, let's just feel like a traffic light. So if you feel that person is safe, this green light hits. If you feel this person is dangerous, this yellow light hits. And if you feel this person is more than dangerous, the red light hits. And that's a system that we're gonna talk about that has not been acknowledged by the scientific community until very, very recently. And it explains everything. So first of all, this mode you're in, how your body interprets the outside world and, and internalizes it, this is your autonomic state. It's completely involuntary and it changes everything about your body. Nothing is the same. This is everything. Depending on your autonomic state, your body completely transforms. You might not turn green like the Hulk, but you might as well because everything inside your body is different depending simply on how safe you feel. And this is the filter through which you experience the entire world. Smells smell differently, tastes taste differently, sights seem different. The same person or experience when you're feeling one way will come off to you as pleasant. The same person when you're feeling upset will come off a different way. And that's because autonomic state is the single most important thing for how you actually experience the world. Now first let's talk about this green state. This is that parasympathetic state, the Bruce Banner state. This is the safety state. So when your green state is activated, you feel safe, you feel good, and your body transforms. Your heart rate slows down, your saliva and digestion are stimulated, the cranial nerve that activates your facial muscles is activated, so when you can talk to people, you have more emotion, facial expression, you have increased vocal prosody and eye contact with people around you. And this is really cool, these tiny little middle ear muscles in your head, they activate, and what they allow you to do is pick up the frequencies in the mid-range that are associated with human voice. This is so you can actually pick up the sounds of people talking, even in loud and crowded environments. The human voice is very special to the brain for somewhat obvious reasons, but it's only special when you feel safe. So the next zone is the yellow zone. This is what happens when you're in danger. When here your heart speeds up, your pain tolerance goes up, you get flat facial affect, and those middle ear muscles I described, they actually shut down. What that allows you to do is instead of hearing the middle frequencies associated with human speech, you hear super low frequencies and super high frequencies. These are what we call predator sounds. This is the sound of a, of a panther in the brush or a screaming person in pain because your body is expecting danger. And instead of thinking, I'm gonna be diplomatic and talk to people, it's thinking to itself, I gotta look out for scary things. So when you feel danger, your audiology signal shifts and you actually hear different frequencies at different volumes, which is pretty crazy. And this is the red zone. Red does not show up on the screen. Um, this is the, there we go. Thanks guys. This is the life-threatening situation. And this is the system that 
up until now has not widely been acknowledged by the scientific community. So to understand this, we need to understand that when people are in extreme danger to the point where their nervous system thinks they're about to die, different things happen to them. They do not fight or flight. They do not run. They do not get activated. What happens to them often is they freeze and they shut down. And this is very interesting because understanding the system explains everything about trauma, as well as numerous other psychiatric issues. So understand what neuroception is. Neuroception is the difference between charming and creepy. You meet people, and there's some people that got big smiles, and they talk with so much grace, and you just love them, and they're charming. And there's other people who are just kind of creepy. And think about who those creepy people are. They've got like a flat face, right? And they've got a super monotone low voice, and they're very scowly. And this is what our neuroception is doing. It's saying, it's scanning these people and it's saying, I want to be next to them. I met this dude in 2004 and he was a state senator and I was shaking at the knees and I had no idea what was happening to me and I just wanted to marry him. And it was weird. And it's because my neuroception was like, what? That guy, I don't care. <laughs> sure, have my children. Um, but then you meet people who are just like, uh, and you're like, get out of here. What's up with that? <laughs> and this is what neuroception is. It's why we like some people and some things instantly. We don't even think about it. It's just internalized in us. But it's... Okay. Uh, that guy's so funny, right? He's fantastic. <clears throat> so, um... There's danger to this. I'm sorry, there we go. So, so this, is the, this is the neurological underpinnings of what we've been talking about, right? about the fear response, yellow, red, yeah? And if, did anyone catch the freezing part and think of things like dissociation? Yeah, right. Um, these are systems that they happen to our brains, our, our entire neuro system can shut down or freeze in those kind of moments. And with people with trauma, what we might think is very frightening may be very different to them, right? If they just have an experience that's close, an approximation to something, a reminder, then they can become terribly frightened. And maybe they're in the orange zone rather than the full red zone, but can we reach them at that moment with words, with interpretations? Probably not. Can we reach them with a cup of coffee? Maybe, right? Can we reach them with a sandwich? Yeah. Freud was famous for giving uh, the Wolfman, one of his early patients, sandwiches and serving him tea. And it wasn't because it was a brilliant interpretation, it was because this guy was a mess, right? And there wasn't much else to do, so he would do this kind of thing. And it helped the Wolfman because then he didn't feel quite so alienated, quite so frightened, etc. Okay, so two more slides and I promise I'll stop and then I'll turn it over to your counseling center leader and then we'll go from there. This is just a paper, if you're interested in reading it, which has to do with how we cultivate and how we can kind of hardwire this idea of therapeutic presence and using all of our paralinguistic tools in encounters with everybody with students, with parolees, with our patients, etc., with our family members. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't leave out that, right? Our, our daughters, our sons, our spouses, our significant others, etc., etc. It's very, very useful. So um, I, I mentioned that the guy that was in the film just now, Seth Porges, a neuroscientist, his father is the author of this paper, Stephen Porges, and he developed that green, yellow, red theory, and he's researched it for the last 40 years, starting with prairie voles, which are little like little rodents, and mountain voles, right? And then he's moved from that kind of mouse models up to human beings and found lots of evidence to suggest that this capacity, our capacity, humans' capacity, to help other people when they're in terrible states of distress and upset and overwhelm, and we use these different channels of communication that it actually works. It helps them relax. It helps them open their minds. 
Okay, so rather than going through every element of that, I'll just give you the, the abridged version of what I think tends to work pretty well when we're encountering someone who's really overwhelmed, yeah? Anyone know what it looks like when someone looks overwhelmed? Yeah, it's like big eyes or you can see that their chest is rising and falling very fast or they get that scowly look, that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. So here's what we can do. One, we want to channel kind of the opposite energy that they are giving off. Yeah. So if they are super tight and super uh, anxious or angry, we want to do the opposite thing. We want to be as laid back and relaxed as we can be, as much as we can tolerate and as much as we can soften. So we soften our facial expressions. We use a softer tone of voice. We try to hit that mid-range, which is where they might be able to hear, right? We smile with our eyes, very important. Smiling with our face and not smiling with our eyes, creepy, very creepy stuff. We don't do that, right? And above all, you yourself, the person that's a provider, try as best you can to be mentally and emotionally relaxed. And one of the greatest things there is just like, you can't fix everything in a day. It's okay if you're upset. It's okay if you're not completely with it, but you're gonna do your very best, yeah? The next thing that we can do as we're doing this is try to validate the person's emotions if they are present, if they are speaking of them, if they're giving any kind of clues as to what they're going through. Because empathy goes a really long, a long way. We, now we wanna dis differentiate that from, you know, kind of invalidating poor behavior, right? Because some of our clients, when they're upset, will do things that really aren't very productive for them or for our setting. So we do need to kind of at least frame that and set boundaries there. But my goodness, if we set a boundary, we should do it gently. Yeah, okay, good. Um, then try to take a mental walk in their own, in their shoes. Imagine aloud to them what it might be like or what you think it might be like and take ownership of that. I have no idea if this is what's going on with you, but God, if I were sitting there where you are, I'd be this way. And then if they correct you, beautiful. No, you're completely wrong. It's like this. Oh, thank you. Great. Tell me more. Then, then you've got them joining. And of course, so helpful being okay with being wrong, right? Being okay with not getting it right every moment of every day. I know you've got worries about your supervisors watching films or you know, hearing about the encounter, et cetera, but unburden yourself from having to be right all the time. I bet you your supervisors don't get it right all the time either. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and then the last thing, which has to do with trying to increase their capacity to reflect on themselves, to reflect on the situation, to reflect on their emotions, be kind of ridiculously curious about what's going on with them. You know, without being too nosy, without being too, in, you know, impinging upon them, but really express genuine interest in them as a person. All right? This is Peter Fonagy, right? His teacher who gave him a random book, but he was convinced that it was very special. She gave it very specially to him, that kind of thing. And then, of course, if the inter interaction is going south, if all of your efforts to try to help them regulate are not going well, it's okay to take a break and come back to it and try to re-engage later, right? Rome is not built in a day. Our capacity to help people learn to trust us does not happen overnight, not very quickly often. And then, um, you know, game plan with them. If they are stuck in something, if they can't find their way out, if you can't find a good solution for it, you know, throw out some win-win options. Well, you could do this or that and try to make both of them win-wins. If they say that's terrible, then you come up with something, what do you got, right? That kind of thing, so that again, they feel more empowered, that you can kind of shift that balance of power a bit from, you know, you're supposed to be the all-knowing professional, they are down here, that's not a good position to be in, right? So you can sort of shift that up a bit and say, what do you think? I, I'm frankly a bit lost right now, I don't know what to do. What's worked for you in the past? That kind of thing can really be quite helpful. All right, that, is all I have to say for tonight. I could keep talking, but I don't think it would serve anybody particularly. Are there questions, comments? Oh, oh. Yes, Angie. 
emotional dysregulation. Can you define that for us and make uh, the tie-in connection to stress and trauma um, and how that manifests itself, I guess? Uh, the definition of it, how emotional dysregulation manifest itself physically and emotionally, I guess, mentally, and the connection to the trauma and, and stress. Oh, great. I, I must have breezed right over that one, right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, emotion dysregulation is essentially the state of an affective arousal that becomes overwhelming to the individual such that their ability to think clearly to act in ways that are rational and reasonable and kind of within the frame of law or whatever social setting they're in, that they become overwhelmed and undone. Now, some people, their emotion dysregulation is very quiet, right? It's all internal, right? And so what happens with them? They begin to unravel internally. They can feel lost. They can feel like that they are losing control of things, yeah? Dissociation is an example of dysregulation that's more internalized. Now, its connection to stress, trauma, et cetera, is that stress, for all of us, makes us less, capa less able to regulate our emotions and affects in the way that we normally would. So our baseline level of affect regulation, wherever that is, stress lowers that threshold so that we simply are not able to do quite as well. End of the day, long day of work, et cetera, my stress regulation, my emotion regulation is less, you know, I'm less capable of managing myself, so I get a little irritable or I might say something that's unpleasant. People who have traumatic experiences, and particularly people with chronic traumatic experiences, their capacity to regulate affect is far more uh, damaged and uh, limited, right? So two things happen in this. One, we have rise times that are very rapid. So a person that has a poor affect regulation or emotional dysregulation can go from zero to 100 very quickly. The trigger can throw them completely off. The other thing that's very consistent with emotion dysregulation is that the decay time, the time to get back to baseline, is very long and very slow, right? And that's where people like us come in to help them learn how to regulate more quickly. It's not that we're ever gonna teach anyone not to get upset or overwhelmed, but rather that they learn how to cope better, faster, recover better. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely.